DC has never been shy of playing around with time and space to explore variations of some of the most well-known and well-liked characters in their canon, from Mark Wade and Alex Ross's Kingdom Come to Grand Morrison and J.G. Jones's Final Crisis, there have been plenty of story arcs that delve into alternate futures and multiversal threats. However, today we're going to explore in detail the 1998 series One Million Saga by Grant Morrison which is set in the far-flung future of the 853rd century, consisting of four core issues and 34 other stories running at the same time, and a tie-in issue numbered 1 million. Let's dive straight into the marvelously futuristic version of DC Comics. Issue number one, Riders on the Storm. The story starts with a little prologue that shows us the angel Zoriel and Plastic Man looking at an emergency transmission from Jean, a.k.a. the Martian Manhunter, about a devastating event that causes over 1 million deaths. The cause unknown. We then cut back to two days earlier, when the Justice League has assembled for a meeting to discuss a time travel event and a possible security breach. Figures claiming to be future versions of the Justice League from the 853rd century, called the Justice Legion A, made up of members such as Superman, Wonder Woman, John Fox's Flash, Our Man, Starman, Batman and Aquaman, have travelled to the 20th century using Our Man's powers, asking for help in honouring the greatest superhero of all time, Superman. After having their identities verified by the 20th century Justice League, the Justice Legion A explains that they're from a rebuilt and recolonized solar system of the future, where each member of the Legion is tasked with patrolling and defending a separate planet. This is possible due to their vast information network, which includes the maintenance of their system's second son, the super-intelligent stellar computer that is Solaris, a future enemy of Superman whose evil programming is reversed in the 505th century at the cost of that time Superman's death. As for the Prime Superman, the Legion explains that in AD 70,001, he returned from his adventures on the rim of time and space and took up a 15,000-year-long self-imposed exile in his solar fortress of solitude, their son. But now, he's coming back to Earth. There's a brief detour where we meet some of the other heroes, like Nightwing and Oracle, who are discussing the disappearance of the Titans. They assume, rightly, that the young heroes went on a mission to prove themselves. We also meet present-day Starman, who looks at his future counterpart on the TV and expresses a sentiment of hope, a theme that will recur throughout the series. We move back to discussing the details of what the ceremony honoring Prime Superman will entail. After some back and forth, most of them decide to go to the future, while Martian Manhunter elects to stay behind and coordinate. On the second day, we find Huntress still expressing her skepticism to Batman about the Justice Legion A. Batman reassures her that it should be okay, but that soon turned upside down when he encounters his Legion counterpart, who knocks him out and appears to steal his spirit. The other heroes, like Flash and Superman, go on adventures or explore their futures as well, discussing background radiation, time-space displacement, and different Superman across time. They all decide to meet at Mount Rushmore as their rendezvous point from whence to go to the future. Meanwhile, in northern Mongolia, the Titans are tracking some Russian arms dealers who have got their hands on five decommissioned Rocket Red warsuits, think DC's version of Iron Man tech, and are auctioning them off to go to the highest bidder. The highest bidder in this case happens to be recurring DC bad guy Vandal Savage, an immortal crow magnon who considers ruling the world as a light hobby. The Titans underestimate his power and decide to ambush him, but soon find themselves outmatched by Savage's tactical skills, technology, and sheer strength. He puts the four defeated heroes, Arrow, Jesse Quick, Arsenal, and Supergirl, in the rocket red suits, calling them his four horsemen of the apocalypse. Back at Mount Rushmore, our man sends the main heroes of the Justice League to the future, or so he supposes, and soon after finds himself infected with a virus. As the issue comes to a close, we see a splash panel showing us a brief glimpse into the future, where Vandal Savage explains that the plan set in motion so long ago is now starting to bear fruit. The Justice Legion A are trapped in prehistory, and their primitive counterpart is stuck in a solar system under the control of him and his partner, revealed to be Solaris. The super-intelligent star seems to have turned evil again and is in cahoots with Savage, intent on not just killing the present-day Justice League, but also wiping out the Superman dynasty. Issue number two, The Day After Tomorrow. The second issue begins with Blue Beetle passing through the wreckage of the destruction of Montevideo that the series opened with in issue number one. He encounters Justice Legion A and has only started to figure out Solaris's plan, which is to send the virus through our man back in time and trap them there. Aquaman laments to Martian Manhunter that his team will most definitely die in the future, but Manhunter holds out hope. At the JLA Watchtower, Steel implores Big Barda to let him go back to the planet to see his family, but she explains that the Oracle's last message was that the virus infects machines and humans alike, which means anyone who goes down there will be compromised. She also explains that the five people in the Watchtower, Zoriel, Plastic Man, Huntress, Steel, and Barda herself, might be Earth's last hope. Zoriel urges Steel to stay, 
as they need his help in building a time machine to bring back the Chowter members of the JLA. We then move to Gotham Labs, where Ray Palmer, aka The Atom, offers to help Oracle with the virus by shrinking down to a cellular level and going inside her body, and discovers the disease to be some form of advanced molecular machine in her bloodstream attacking her lymphocytes, white blood cells. Back at Montevideo, Firestorm tries to attack the Justice Legion A because he believes them to have caused this whole problem, but Legion Superman states that it's the virus that's been making everyone erratic. The fight is stopped by Martian Manhunter who explains that his shape-changing DNA is temporarily containing the spread of the Hourman virus, while everyone else is starting to show signs of infection. The story then moves to Vanishing Point, which is a house at the end of time, sort of like Kang Citadel in Loki, that acts as the headquarters for the Guardians of Linear Time. They're discussing the anomalies popping up when Matthew Ryder, who is examining them, comes back and foreshadows something ominous on the rise. At present, the US military is debating whether to release the Specialist Ultramarine Corps unit when their transmission was hijacked by Vandal Savage, who explains that Montevideo was not the original target. It was Washington, D.C., but someone infected his computer system and caused a guidance failure. He continues, telling them that three more missiles will be dropping shortly and that there's nothing anyone can do to stop him. The Justice Legion A scrambles to stop him. What Savage doesn't mention in the transmission is that the missiles are actually the Rocket Red Warsuits, and that the first one that dropped on Montevideo contained Garth. As the issue comes to a close, Savage launches the other three warsuits and engages in a casual Nazi-quoting monologue about how tomorrow belongs to him. Issue number three, Solaris, Rising. As humanity in the present falls into chaos and Vandal Savage rejoices in the fall of civilization, issue number three of the One Million Saga opens with the Justice Legion A and the Watchtower heroes building Solaris up in space. The virus seems to be making everyone worse, but future Batman seems to be the worst of all, as he beats up Starman for supposedly betraying the Legion and being Solaris's accomplice. We learn later that Starman didn't want to take up this mantle, which is what drove him to so easily be swayed by Solaris. He reveals that the night fragment he carries is actually made of kryptonite, and that he's been tasked with burying it under the sands of Mars, so that Solaris can use it in the future to assassinate Superman Prime when he emerges. Meanwhile, at Gotham Labs, the Atom, still inside Oracle's bloodstream, finally figures out how to defeat the virus. He explains that it's a fairly simple biomechanism that can be weakened by erasing parts of its program at a cellular level. As she's broadcasting this good news to Nightwing, she receives a call from an unlikely character, Arsenal. We see that Martian Manhunter is in Egypt, closing in on Savage and his blitz machines that he'd created and hidden while allied with Hitler during World War II. He attacks Savage and gains the upper hand with the help of the Titans, who are all revealed to be alive. Garth says he used the ice in the atmosphere to escape and subsequently saved the others. It looks like they have Savage apprehended, but using an incendiary arrow, he creates a smoke screen and manages to escape, but not before losing one eye to the battle. The Justice Legion A activates Solaris, and they wonder if they've done the right thing. Batman explains that good always wins out in the end because it's simply a matter of statistics. The virus then starts leaving everyone's bodies on the planet and towards Solaris in the form of a cloud of viral dust. Turns out that the virus was a program in disguise now downloading itself into its true home. As Solaris starts to awaken, our man warns that his plasma venting could destroy the air. Starman, in a feat of self-sacrifice, throws Solaris out into deep space while lamenting his actions and remembering his heritage. Back at the Watchtower, the Legion is still trying to find a way to stop Solaris and save the future. Superman offers to use the last of his energy to punch through the time barrier and go back to the 853rd century, and the Legion reiterates just how hard it's going to be for the Justice League to defeat Solaris in the future on their own. However, Huntress interjects, and as this issue comes to a close, she says that she has an idea of how to save the future. Issue number 4, Death Star. The final issue of this series opens with future Superman trying to break the time barrier as it's aging him. The whole process creates bruises over time, but the future Superman is determined as the Justice League is going to need help. Meanwhile, Solaris is defeating thousands of superheroes in the future and causing widespread destruction in the solar system. The Justice League is discussing strategy on Jupiter while Mitchell Shelley, aka the Resurrection Man, has taken many heroes to Mars to check on the scale of the threat. The League sees that the Green Lantern is mentioned nowhere in Solaris's database, which gives them an edge. Savage gives the Night Fragment to Solaris so that it can shoot into the sun and assassinate Superman Prime. He says that he's also taken Resurrection Man's time gauntlets and will use them to teleport to Earth so that he can watch Superman Prime die from his throne. In Resurrection Man's dying moments, the Martian Manhunter comes to him and reveals Huntress's plan to him. Basically, they've had centuries to plan against Solaris's attack by carefully placing their secret weapons timed across eons. Solaris is assaulted by a variety of teams 
including the Justice League X and Marvel family members. The Justice League also joins in the fight in an effort to buy time for the Green Lantern to penetrate Solaris, reach his core, and plant a black hole there. However, they soon learn that they also have to retrieve a DNA sample from the Stellar Engine's core, and that Flash's calculations through the strategy engine show that Solaris has defenses against a black hole attack. They switch to Plan B, where Batman explains to Green Lantern, who's retrieved the DNA sample by now, that he needs to destabilize the Intelligent Star's core and trigger a supernova event. Then contain it. Meanwhile, future Superman manages to break the time barrier and reach his own time, which reverses his aging and returns his powers. With minutes to spare, he flies to the scene of the battle, where Lantern has triggered the core collapse and created a big vault to contain Solaris' supernova explosion. However, the Night Fragment gets through the containment and heads for the Sun. The League reveals that this has been planned for, and future Superman uses his Force Vision barrier to aid Lantern's efforts in containing the supernova as long as he can, which isn't that long. While this is happening, present-day Superman races to catch the Night Fragment, the kryptonite bullet before it reaches the sun. Superman fails, but as planned by the Martian Manhunter and Starman's efforts 83,000 years ago, the Night Fragment actually contains the lost ring of Green Lantern. Consequently, Superman Prime emerges from the sun, shining and yellow, and destroys the remnants of Solaris. Future Batman reveals to present Batman that sending him to the future was an absolute necessity. But soon after, everyone, including 10 billion thinking suns, stand silent for a span to acknowledge the return of Truth's greatest champion. In the epilogue, Prime Superman, with help from the Fifth Dimension Superman, uses the retrieved DNA sample to recreate a silver super-powered Lois Lane, and the two of them recreate Krypton, where they live together happily ever after. In the present, the Justice League celebrate their efforts and celebrate their camaraderie across centuries. Batman and Huntress discuss how she was inspired to make the plan by looking at children's time capsules and Batman states that he's enjoyed watching her grow into a full-fledged JLA member. Superman and Martian Manhunter ponder their immortality and the coming threats on the horizon, but with a renewed sense of determination. The series ends on a somewhat Sisyphean but hopeful note that good will always win. But that's not the end. In a short second epilogue, we see Vandal Savage ending up on Earth using the Time Gauntlet, but not in the future. Through a careful con from Gabriel Walker, aka Kronos, he ends up in Montevideo just before the Rocket Red Warsuit makes an impact. With this knowledge, Resurrection Man dies in the 853rd century with a smile on his face. Action Comics number 1 million, Brave New Hero. Our first tie-in revolves around Superman taking place when the present-day version of him arrives in 853rd century Metropolis, ready for his celebratory challenge. He's greeted by the city's denizens, chief among them being Luther Luther, a descendant of Lex Luther, and Mayor Gerarda Olsen, a descendant of Daily Planet's Jimmy Olsen. They escort him to a tesseract, folded infinite space within finite space, where his challenge is to take place. The challenge involves Superman facing off with the perfect solids, geometric blocks that can transform and adapt as they continue fighting their foe. Considering the early stages of the challenge and advantage, Superman outmaneuvers the solids and destroys one. Soon, however, Solaris sneaks into the Tesseract undetected and takes control of the perfect solids, puppeteering them in such a way as though to make it seem that Superman is throwing them into the crowd. As this is happening, the telepathic communications system, Headnet, suspects that the prime superheroes may, in fact, be bizarro synthetics from the plague years. Consequently, the crowd starts turning on Superman as he tries to figure out what exactly is going wrong. He suspects he's been set up by a hidden third party and tries to get away from the arena and out of the Tesseract. Just as he's out in the real world again, searching for this time period Superman's Fortress of Solitude, he's ambushed by Captain Metamorph, a hero with the powers of Captain Marvel and Metamorpho. Just as he's defeated the hybrid hero by using smarts and endurance, in comes negative Gorilla Queen and then Green Infection. But they're all eventually defeated and outwitted by Superman. It does slow him down though, which gives the Hawkmen time to neutralize and capture him. He appeals to their better nature, and they offer him a chance to prove his innocence. They take him to the Junkyard Tesseract, where he's reunited with Platinum, the loveliest of Doc Magnus's metal men. With her help, Superman proves his innocence to the Hawkmen, and together they set out to find the real culprit. With a little health and ingenuity, they manage to take down Headnet. Superman, now free of telepathic interference, can hear again and is able to find the Fortress of Solitude, which is built inside the statue that's supposed to honor him. The issue ends here, and the story picks up again in Adventures of Superman 1 Million. Shadow of the Bat, number 1 million, a never-ending story. This tie-in issue takes place in Gotham, and we start with the future Batman in 1998, or present day when the comic came out, 
taking down criminals in Gotham and recapping for Zoron and the audience some of the events of the main series, mainly about the Hourman virus infecting the planet. Future Batman is trying to find a cure for that very same virus, but first he has to discover present-day Batman's secret base where the necessary technology that he needs is kept. He's also caught trying to get information, but manages to make a daring escape involving a motorcycle chase, but not before saving a couple of innocent people. Future Batman recalls a similar plague that took over Pluto in the year 85,245. The Joker had released a laughing virus over Pluto, which had become a prison planet over the years. Zoron and a bunch of other villains escaped confinement as a result and took over the planet, causing death and chaos for death days and slaughtering men, women and children. When it was finally over, he recalls one surviving child vowed never to let it happen again and that was him, the Batman. Back in the present day, Gordon confronts Batman after he saves the innocent people. Batman assures him of his identity and intentions and then reassures Gordon that he's a good cop before disappearing into the night. Gordon asks to get in touch with Nightwing for help. We move to the 853rd century again when it's revealed that Batman is actually recounting everything to Zoron via a tape that Two-Face found. The villains are all watching it together, and just as the tape runs out, Batman drops into their lair and kicks their asses while doing a modified version of his famous I am vengeance, I am night soliloquy. He banishes all the villains to Tesseract space with a sentence of life imprisonment, and the issue comes to a paradoxical close as the issue states that the fight against crime is never-ending. The story, however, is continued in Nightwing number 1 million. Nightwing 1 million, the anachronism, a continuation of the shadow of the bat. This tie-in issue begins with the titular hero Nightwing meeting the 853rd century Batman as they have a brief introduction in the midst of an even briefer scuffle where they test each other's abilities. After Batman reiterates just how ancient Nightwing's era is, they look over a site of ruin caused by recent earthquakes, and Batman observes how Gotham is at its high point right now, which understandably is a bit depressing to young Dick. In these ruins, they encounter Sly Fox and his accomplice is trying to steal a vault. Naturally, the two heroes employ their trademark tactics of technology and acrobatics to thwart the criminals and leave them tied up for the cops to find. Next, they discuss the Hourman virus and how it's actually nanotechnology and indecipherable by the technology of 1998. Batman recalls some of the harrowing aspects of crime and Pluto and compares it to the way that Gotham is slowly going because of the virus. In order to find a cure, he tells Nightwing, they need a supercomputer and as much memory as he can find. Consequently, Nightwing says they should head for the Batcave, but not before Dick takes over an abandoned speedboat to keep up with future Batman since the Dark Knight of Pluto can manipulate gravity fields or, hmm, to put simply, fly. The story continues in Detective number 1 million. Green Lantern number 1 million, Starcrossed. This issue stars Kyle Gardner as he's thrust into the 853rd century for his challenge, which takes place on Starman's space station near Uranus. Yeah, the joke is tread on multiple times throughout the saga, which is now actually Solaris. He's greeted on the station by an alien named Bob everyone's convenience, who explains to him the station is empty, save for Starman's menagerie of prisoners, and all the audience is simply projecting themselves in for the event from the comfort of their home. He also explains that Green Lantern's celebratory challenge is one of speed and skill, essentially a race inside a tesseract against the Mac Turtle, an automaton that's only half as accurate as the name. Although he's supposed to be a projection made of solid light, like the audience and Bob, once the race starts, the Lantern finds himself being susceptible to his attacks, similar to those he creates with his ring. Soon, the race goes underwater, and Lantern creates a giant octopus to slow the turtle down. After that, they go through a primeval forest and a desert, and after a little back and forth, the Green Lantern comes out as the winner after creating a low bridge to obstruct the Mac Turtle. To his surprise, there is no one on the station anymore when he comes out of the Tesseract and he sees that the Mac Turtle has also disintegrated upon arrival. He deduces that someone essentially cut the power, which also means that Starman's menagerie of monsters is now freely roaming. With some quick thinking, Lantern is able to trap the creatures in bubbles. But there's a bigger problem on the horizon. He needs to find a way to restart the station before life support runs out. The ring can fuel the station, so all he has to do is find the right socket. Therefore, he starts exploring the station, which seems to be bigger on the inside like the uh, TARDIS in Doctor Who. He eventually finds the power core and restarts it using the ring. Once the power is back on and the menagerie is contained, he decides to poke around a bit. He comes across decrypted messages between Solaris and Starman about the plan to trap the Justice League in the future and exact revenge on them. Once he realizes that Starman has betrayed them, he tries to sneak away to inform the others reaching close to Mars. He wonders about Solaris's plan and the fact that someone will have to tell Jack Knight that his descendant 
is a Judas. Just as he arrives at the conclusion that Solaris may have been the one to shut down power to the station, he is confronted by the super-intelligent star computer. Solaris says that he can't let Lantern compromise his plans, and so, with a single blast, the being shoots him into Mars's atmosphere, where, just before crashing, he's caught by giant hands coming out of the red sand. The issue ends here. The story continues in Martian Manhunter number 1 million. The Power of Shazam, number 1 million, between The Rock and a Hot Place. This issue starts by stating that The Rock of Eternity that Shazam once called home had now been occupied by his successor and, for eons, had not been tethered interdimensionally to an outside world. But then, suddenly, the long silence is broken when a character named Sutra accidentally stumbles onto this place. She sees that it's a treasure trove of information which is the main form of currency in the 853rd century. On Mercury, where she lives alongside the data dynamo machines that process information and the information-poor folk of the city, her son Tanist waits for her to return. As she does, she tells him of the treasure, and that by selling it to the Tinker, they'll be rich enough to live in the domed cities, which are the topside luxury parts of Mercury. Because Tanist is crippled and can't run, Sutra asks him to stay behind while she goes to sell the treasure. During this time, Tanist is confronted by Prospero, who wants to claim Sutra's treasure for himself. The two of them get into an argument and suddenly find themselves transported through a portal to the Rock of Eternity. They come across the master of the cave, an old man in a Captain Marvel costume. Prospero accidentally wakes him up from his seeming slumber, and we learn that it's actually an old Billy Batson. As he awakes, he's disoriented and hallucinates Tanist as Freddie Freeman, his old friend who had a similar disability like Tanist. Prospero tries to attack Tanist and Billy by dropping a large rock on them, but because of Billy's powers, they're both saved. Billy defeats Prospero and tells Tanist that he'll help him in some way as soon as he starts to remember more of his life and purpose. Soon after, Sutra finds herself in the middle of the stampede, as Prospero informs everyone of the portal leading to the Rock of Eternity, which prompts a bunch of information-poor, super-powered people to come into Billy's home. They all look at him with wonder, and ask if he's one of the prime heroes here for the celebration. Soon, the overwhelming circumstances devolve into an all-out skirmish between Billy and the home invaders, and Prospero wonders how he'll charge all these people for the treasure if there's no way to communicate, as the headnet doesn't work here, and if Billy dies in one of these fights. Billy, however, remembers about Tanist, and so, instead of fighting everyone, takes the boy and escapes. On their way out, they see Sutra trampled to death by the mob. He explains to a distraught Tanist how he lost his family as well, and how he found Freddy and others who took him in. As they reach the top, Billy decides that Tanist is a good enough person and decides to bestow upon him the power of Shazam. Seeing this spectacle, the people around them wonder if Captain Marvel is actually the Flash, and around the same time, Ednick goes silent. This makes the people think it was caused by two new superheroes, and thus they turn on them. Tanist and Billy manage to escape by taking flight, and set out to find the Flash, who's somewhere on Mercury, as he might need their help. The issue ends, and the story continues in Flash number 1 million. Young Justice, number 1 million, just ice. Cube. This issue revolves around a young team of Justice League adjacent superheroes in the 853rd century, which includes Superboy, the one millionth clone of the original, Robin, the toy wonder, Batman's AI robot with his younger personality, and Impulse, the personification of random thoughts of speedsters that travel through the Speed Force, among others. The issue starts on Pluto, at the Young Justice headquarters, where the toy wonder has brought back a cryogenic tube that he discovered floating in the asteroid belt, and which supposedly contains an original member of Young Justice. Impulse tries to get into the tube to see who it is exactly, that triggers some sort of protective program that keeps him out. With that plan failed, Toy Wonder starts to devise a program to revive whoever's in there, which is supposed to take at least two hours. While waiting, the three of them start recounting tales of some of the original Young Justice members. It starts with Superboy telling a story about the time a villain named Doomsday was roaming free on Earth. Everyone who went up against him failed, and even Superman couldn't defeat him. In fact, Doomsday managed to kill Superman. The artwork evokes the famous image from the death of Superman. But then one voice challenged him to battle, the original Superboy. After a supposed planet-moving fight that contains a few different cheeky references to older Superman stories, Superman manages to defeat Doomsday by hurtling him into space. The other two accuse Superboy of embellishing the story, and to prove what a factual recounting is like, 
the Toy Wonder offers to tell a story of the original Robin. Naturally, it starts with the Sun Eater threatening to uh, eat the sun. This caused darkness and ice falling over Gotham City, on which Batman slipped and broke his back. The sun going out also caused all the other heroes to lose their powers and fall out of the sky. Robin puts Batman in a bat buddy cast and goes to town on the villains loose in Gotham. In between these bouts, he tries to rouse the fallen hero's spirits and, with some wordplay, manages to give Superman an idea on how to defeat the Sun Eater by giving him a Heimlich to make him cough the sun back out. Dr. Fate then seals him into a pocket dimension. Again, the other two find this story hard to believe, considering there are quite a few contrivances in it. Now it's Impulse's turn. His story involves the original Young Justice members coming across a giant feather. Soon, the ground starts shaking, and suddenly a giant egg falls on the heroes, covering them in yolk. And where there's a giant egg, there's bound to be a giant chicken, or rather, the Millennium Chicken. The other two cut him off right there and soon get into an argument about the details of what giant animal it actually was. This soon spirals out of control as it turns into the three of them trying to speed up the revivication process. Naturally, this blows up in their faces, well, quite literally, and the cryogenic tube breaks to reveal Ash. Turns out, Young Justice incinerated whoever was in there. Well, that's that, they decide, and uh, vow to keep it to themselves heroically posing as the issue comes to a close, and the kids hopefully get some therapy afterwards. Batman number 1 million, peril within the prison planet. The caped crusader startles awake in this tie-in issue that takes place on future Batman's custodial planet of Pluto in the 853rd century. Prime Batman wonders what happened, and as if on cue, the toy wonder shows up to answer his questions. The planet, he explains, has been hollowed out to create a prison asylum for the solar system's degenerates, and future Batman and Toy Wonder are its keepers. Imagine Arkham Asylum, but Pluto-sized. Toy Wonder also explains that future Batman took Prime Batman's soul and transferred it into a clone of his, allowing him to be in the future and participate in his celebratory challenge. Before Batman can ask any follow-ups, the challenge starts, and he finds himself jumping from ledge to ledge, dodging boulders and such, as Toy Wonder watches nearby from the Omni-Bat, or future Batmobile. However, something goes horribly wrong and the inmates escape. But this event isn't just affecting Pluto, as all the other planets report problems too. Robin suggests Batman get to the Justice Legion A headquarters orbiting Jupiter, while he tries to contain the prisoners here. In order for Batman to get to Jupiter, however, the duo needs to reach the Batcave first, which is going to be hard to open since there's a planet-wide lockdown. Robin suggests that there's one prisoner who could help them break in, but as they're sending the message, they're attacked by Metaclay. Batman reluctantly takes the wheel as Robin mans the plasma cannons, and they manage to have a conversation about future Batman and Toy Wonder's origins. Robin's consciousness, it turns out, is of a younger future Batman, but before the traumatic event that turns him into the dark, brooding archetype he is. Because Robin, the Toy Wonder, retains a sense of optimism and innocence, he's forever boyish and hopeful about the world, making him a great compliment to future Batman. They go through Riddle City, barely managing to escape its clutches, only to come face to face with Dice God and his judgment, which is unsurprisingly swift death. With careful flying, they flee the Dice God as well, and enter the Tesseract that houses the Batcave. But because they can't close it behind them, the villains enter as well. Just as all hope of getting into the Batcave seems lost though, Catwoman enters the scene, being the only person who can open the doors of the cave. The issue ends here and the story is continued in Catwoman number 1 million. Man of Steel number 1 million, Fear and Loathing. This issue begins with the people in Metropolis, specifically at Lexcom, reacting to the devastation in Montevideo in 1998, and speculations about the Justice Legion ace hand in it is going around. As Lois, Jimmy, and a few other reporters are watching Blue Beetle's broadcast from Montevideo that seems to contribute in incriminating the future heroes, the feed is cut and hijacked by the villain Vandal Savage. Jimmy tries to salvage the transmission using the computer, but is instead infected with the Hourman virus, which quickly spreads to the rest of the reporters. Soon, even Jimmy starts to believe that the Justice Legion A is evil, and their opinion is reinforced by the Metal Men, who have also been infected by the Hourman virus. Meanwhile, as future Superman is trying to figure out what to do next, he's attacked by the Metal Men, but even in his waning state is able to defeat them. This display only further distances the people from Superman, who are now clouded by the virus and sure that he's evil. The remnants of the Metal Men all combine into a singular form and start attacking Superman again, but are still no match for the Man of Steel. As he deactivates each of the metals, Doc Magnus, their creator, comes in and clarifies that the virus had corrupted his creations almost instantly and they turned on him. He also affirms that future Superman is telling the truth. As they discuss a way to get rid of the virus, Superman realizes that Solaris could only have done this. Lois misses a proper meeting with the future Superman as he flies away to stop the nuke, 
which is in fact a rocket red warsuit with arsenal inside it. Doc Magnus generously leaves his flying saucer behind, and Superman uses it to quickly intercept the incoming weapon. Since it can be remotely controlled, Savage uses its offensive capabilities to shoot down Superman, but is unsuccessful. The issue ends on a cliffhanger where Superman is riding the rocket red warsuit. Nice little tongue twister for you there, and the story continues in Superman number one million. Starman number 1 million, all the starlight shining. Starman number 1 million starts with an eternal monologue by an unlikely character, the orbiting citadel that serves as Starman's headquarters. It explains that Solaris, whom the citadel orbits, was responsible for bringing life to distant planets of the solar system like Neptune and Pluto. The citadel also complains about being lonely without Starman. Back in 1998 in Opal City, Ted Knight, the original Starman, finds himself under attack from Deathbolt, a paid assassin. However, future Starman interjects and saves Ted while Deathbolt makes a run for it. He reveals to Ted that he's his direct descendant, named Faris Knight, carrying on the mantle. They sit down for a catch-up session, starting with the fact that there was no Starman for three millennia in between, and how Faris came across the Quadrant, aka the Gravity Rod, aka the Cosmic Rod. Faris explains that his great-grandfather was once stranded on an asteroid after being attacked by space pirates. After months, a comet landed on the asteroid and it carried the Quadrant. Consequently, he became Starman and the role had since then been passed down. They go for a walk outside, under the stars, and discuss the Starman lineage. Faris explains that some of the Starmen were villains, and only a few were noteworthy, while others were largely forgotten by history. After a few more history lessons about great inventors, Faris comes to the real reason he came to meet with Ted. During his tenure as Starman, Ted came across a green rock that fell from the sky, and Faris needs to bury it under the sands of Mars so that it can fulfill a greater destiny in the future. Ted hands over the rock to Faris without issue, as he believes Faris will do the right thing with it. He repeats the same out loud, and it prompts Faris to come clean about his true intentions. He tells him that he intends to betray the Justice Legion A, as Solaris, whose evil form he awoke during a trip to its core, has offered him freedom from the mantle of Starman in return. He explains that he never wanted to pick up the mantle, but reluctantly did so because everyone assumed him to. Ted tells him that he can always quit, but Faris retorts that he likes the perks of being a hero too much, which Ted explains actually makes him sound more like a villain. Faris agrees, and in his anger, destroys Ted's telescope. He also says that since his lineage is now secure, he can kill Ted. Ted says that he has no problem dying, but only asks Faris that he look within himself afterward and try to see and accept the good in him just as clearly as he's seen and accepted the evil. He tells Faris that no matter what, he's proud of him. The issue ends with Ted's fate unknown, Faris flying off into space. Impulse number one million, desperate times a million. Set shortly after the Montevideo incident, this issue opens with future Flash, John Fox, asking future Superman for suggestions on what to do next. Superman tells him to seek out Impulse, who's still a young kid in this time period, take his help on the matter of stopping the virus or the nuclear bombs. Flash sets out to find Manchester, Alabama, where Impulse lives. Meanwhile, Bart Allen, aka Impulse, is discussing the virus with his mother when he learns of the news that a nuclear missile, which he recognizes to be a rocket red warsuit, has been stopped over India. He races to catch up with the warsuit, but is intercepted on the way by future Flash. He tries to explain to Impulse that he's not a bad guy, and recounts the events of the main series so far while filling him in on the general state of things in the 853rd century. Bart's not convinced, and ties Flash up in an effort to get him to tell the real truth. However, as you can expect, Flash gets out pretty easily and ties Bart up instead. After making a meta-reference to the obligatory bonding scuffle and some cat-and-mouse chasing, the two speedsters come across a red rocket warsuit and attempt to stop it. Since the suit is remotely controlled, it starts attacking the two of them, but soon returns to its determined flight path toward its intended target. With Flash's speedster detecting technology from the future, they also figure out that Jesse Quick is inside the warsuit, and they need to figure out a way to save her. Flash gives Bart a telepathic communication so that they can stay in contact, but immediately realizes his mistake. Because Bart was raised in a virtual environment in the future, the telepathic link essentially generates a virtual environment for the two of them, a mock-up of the 853rd century. As the two of them are exploring it, the warsuit attacks again and Bart gets an idea. He takes the discs that create the telepathic link and establishes one with Jesse Quick as the warsuit gets close for another strafing run. The two of them now end up in a virtual environment where they can communicate. Bart tells her about Savage's plans and they try to deactivate the warsuit, but can't find a way. Fortunately, Flash has spare discs and he enters the virtual environment as well. He explains that Jessie can disable it from the inside, and as she does, Bart vibrates her out of the suit. Flash explains that while there's still other rockets, a plague and a villain at large, this is a start. The issue ends here, and the story continues in JLA number 1 million. Green Arrow number 1 million, all down the years. In the future, the Earth is a paradise of wildlife, 
and is protected by a band of guardians descended from Oliver Queen called the Green Arrows. This issue follows one such Green Arrow named Hawk, named after Connor Hawk, the second Green Arrow, who finds himself a captive of Grodchild, a cyborg gorilla likely descended from Gorilla Grod. Grodchild holds Hawk's sister Kanara hostage in order to command the Green Arrow to use his powerful secret weapon, the Astral Shaft, to further his cause. Hawk relents and expresses his hatred for Grodchild, considering him an abominable example of technology gone wrong. Hawk also tries to attack Grodchild en route, but his primitive arrows seem no match for the gorilla's technology. While this is happening, back at Grodchild's compound, Kanara makes a daring escape by jumping off a cliff and into the sea. She communicates with some whales and gets them to help her thwart the simian guards following her. Grodchild and Hawk reach the destination, which appears to be a portal in the middle of a field. The gorilla explains that this is actually a sort of back door to the Fortress of Solitude, Superman's home. Through the use of masking technology, they're able to get to Superman almost undetected. There's a brief encounter with one of the protectors of the fortress, which Hawk easily takes down, and Grodchild now reveals that the target of the Astral Shaft is, in fact, Superman from 1998, aka Superman Prime. The Astral Shaft transfers the virus consciousness into the target, and Grodchild explains that since he controls Hawk, once his consciousness is transferred into Superman Prime, he'll control the strongest being in the universe by proxy. This will allow him to defeat the JLA. As Hawk takes aim, he prays for help and they're answered as Kanara reaches out to him with her mind and assures him that she's free and safe from Grodchild's minions. Upon hearing this, Hawk swiftly fires the astral shaft at Grodchild instead of Superman and makes the gorilla beat himself up. They fall down right at Superman's feet, and Hawk introduces himself to the Man of Steel. In return for his kindness, Superman tells Hawk stories of Oliver Queen and Connor Hawk's exploits. Later, at the Green Arrow's home, Kanara and Hawk are celebrated, and Hawk explains that while none of their ancestors are in the future, they can be visited in the past. Using the World Mind, which the Green Arrows use to communicate, and with the knowledge gained from Superman Prime, they can reach back in time to their ancestors with their thoughts. In the present, Connor Hawk startles awake in a monastery from his reverie. He's sweating and disoriented, saying that he's had a vision of the future. He saw descendants of not only himself, but of Oliver as well. And so, through this vision of the future, it becomes clear to him, as the issue comes to a close, that Oliver Queen is still alive. Legionnaires number one million, come together. Legionnaires is a pretty out there comic book in terms of what we've come to expect from the standard DC fare. The Justice Legion L is made up of seven members, and we learn about them and their planets that make up the system of United Planets, which is a radical experiment in interplanetary diplomacy and united secularism. The first member, Brainiac 417, comes from a homeworld of two merged planets and combines species who exist as spirit intellects undistracted by the flesh. Then there's the Mun Elves, who for the sake of simplicity were considering one member from Daxam Imsk, a union of two species that provides balance and harmony. There's Implicate Girl, whose planet Karg exists in a tesseract concealed in her third eye. Titan Girl, the fourth member, comes from Titan, Moon of Telepaths, which is in fact a planet-wide nursing home where the galaxy's highest bidders maintain the Titanian's bodies in exchange for extrasensory glimpses of heaven. The fifth member is the Chameleon, whose reclusive planet is simply called Chameleon World, exists in protective coloration and full communications blackout. Why? Hmm, who knows? Then there's the tribal world of Talok 8, which has not seen evolution since the 20th century. Their tribal, religion-based ways are maintained with the help of their protectors and the Legion's sixth member, the Umbra. Finally, there's Cosmic Butt, the leader of the Legionnaires, and his planet Brawl is at the core of the United Planets, and its people have turned themselves into living metal. We learn all this as part of a story that Brainiac 417 is sharing with Superboy. This was all just set up though. The story's actual narrative begins on Brawl with a villain named Agent If, who's using an illegally modified reality-changing toy called, uh, you guessed it, Reality Toy. The Brawl officers pursuing him are clearly no match for the Reality Toy's powers, but they're saved from perishing by the Mon Elves. Titan Girl is also there, and she asks Agent If to surrender the weapon, but he escapes by teleporting to their son's core. At the core, he destabilizes the sun but Titan Girl projects herself there and outwits him into not existing. Brainiac installs new sunware, but they still have to escape before it takes effect, as the destabilized sun is creating solar flares regularly. The first one renders the ship immobile, and Brainiac 417 pleads with Chameleon to turn himself into a ship. However, Chameleon says that it's a sin to change for any purpose other than camouflage, so he can't. Brainiac 417 tells him to save Implicate Girl at least, if not himself, and so for the other's sake, he turns into a spaceship and saves everyone. Titan Girl debriefs Cosmic Bot about the situation, and he tells her that there's still some danger, as the dreamer is still dreaming of a son. Titan Girl wonders if it's their son or some other one. To get answers, Cosmic Bot decides to consult the Wild Flame, 
which holds 85,000 years of Legion lore. The Umbra tries to stop him, but Cosmic Bod is determined, and although it's a painful experience, the Wild Flame reveals to him many different versions of the Legion, guiding him to the Legion of Superman and Superboy's extraordinary feat of holding the Earth together almost a millennium ago. Cosmic Bot still isn't sure of the answers, so Brainiac 417 asks to get into his mind and do the necessary thinking for him. But before they can reveal the answer, the common center where they're gathered is attacked by mineral-eating giant monsters. The Legionnaires fight with the monsters, prioritizing the protection of the field generators and the Dreamer. One of the beasts injures Cosmic Bud, and as all hope seems lost, Chameleon finally acts and saves everyone, much to his dismay and fear of eternal damnation. Although the Legionnaires are saved, they have a bigger problem on their hands, which is that the cluster magnetism is fading, which could destroy their whole system. Brainiac 417 reveals that all this is happening according to someone's plan, which means that there's a traitor in their midst. He also explains that the Dreamer has learned of Solaris's plan, and that the Legionnaires need to go help Earth, or the return they've been planning for generations will go to waste. He says the cluster magnetism problem is beyond his powers to fix, but there's one Legionnaire who can. Brainiac 417 travels back in time a thousand years and finds Superboy, and as the issue comes to an end, he starts narrating the story of his home to the Legionnaire. The story continues in Legion of Superheroes number 1 million. Azrael number 1 million, Angel Wings, the issue starts with Azrael testing his teleportation wings with Sister Duma. She explains that for centuries they've had to have sophisticated technology that can allow people to masquerade as angels because real angels are notoriously hard to find. As Azrael is getting used to his new wings, popping in and out of time and space, Sister Duma warns him that wherever and whenever he travels to, he should avoid going to a point in space and time where he's already been as meeting an earlier version of himself could cause an inversion of the psychomolecular matrix, which is a complicated way of saying some evil stuff could go down. What that is exactly, we don't know yet. She also warns him to not go back more than a hundred years, as that'll cause him to discorporate and become a pure spirit. Azrael, largely unfazed by the warnings, is eager for his first mission. She asks him to seek truth and beauty, promote harmony in the universe, and most importantly, recognize evil. She also asks him to not take his weapon, as there are mere modifications to be made, notably the ability to cut through reality. Before she has a chance to take questions, however, Azrael disappears, and Sister Dumas wonders if she's going to regret giving him those wings. Azrael, for his part, zips down to Earth to see what he can help with. He encounters a green arrow seemingly fighting a monster and offers to help, taking the bow and shooting the creature dead. Turns out, it's the Green Arrow's martial arts master, the Avenging Angel just killed while they were in the middle of a sparring session. The Arrow, now furious, tells Azrael to get off this planet and stay off. Still determined, Azrael zips to Pluto, as it's a whole planet of rogues, but finds that he's a bit too late to the action. Robin, the Toy Wonder, and Catwoman have already slayed the monster Z-Zorg, who survives by eating cities. Robin feels a little bit bad about killing the creature, and Azrael wonders to Catwoman whether the little machine is hero material. Next, he zips to Mars, where he encounters the special police force of Hawkmen, who are pretty bored. Apparently, there hasn't been any action on a planet named after the God of War or a candy bar. Huh, who knows for sure? And the Hawkmen have just been waiting around for a slumbering creature named Frixit to awaken. The creature awakens every 11 millennia, and depending on what kind it is, the situation could end in battle or joy. Azrael says he'll check back in with them later and zips away again. Quite dismayed by nothing happening in his own time, he decides to travel to the 20th century, just after the earthquakes in Gotham that happened in the main One Million series. This is where the original Azrael operated. Future Azrael is quite excited to see him, engaged in a battle with Two-Face. He decides to help, but soon realizes that because he went back more than a hundred years, he's now only a spirit. Since the original Azrael seems to be handling himself just fine, future Azrael decides to pop back to Mars and look in on the Hawks. To his excitement, Azrael sees that the Frixit has awoken and, despite the Hawksmen's trying to interrupt, kills him. It turns out that this was the joyful kind of Frixit, and he's really messed things up for the Hawkmen. Again, Azrael zips away to see if Sister Dumas has finished with his sword and ends up coming face to face with himself. Calling the other out as evil incarnate, the two Azraels fight for the sword, but are soon stopped by Sister Dumas. She tells him that the other Azrael is a mirror of himself, that recognizing evil means seeing it within yourself. She explains that she once saw her reflection too, and being an angel is more than just about having wings. The two Azraels will eventually merge into each other, and so they set out to find another Frixit as the issue comes to a close. Superman number 1 million down to Earth 
This tie-in issue picks up from where Man of Steel number 1 million left off, with future Superman wrestling with a rocket red warsuit on its way to destroy Metropolis. He manages to free the young Titan Arsenal from the warsuit, but the rocket is still headed for the city. Superman calculates the odds and traps the rocket in his force beam to contain the explosion, and then use the same beam to cushion their impact falling from the sky. But Superman can barely fly anymore. His force beam falls short when it comes to cushioning their impact. Superman makes a hard landing on the street, but manages to save Arsenal. Just as he's getting back up from the fall, the Man of Steel of the future is ambushed by civilians paranoid from the Hourman virus who believe him and his comrades to be responsible for the destruction of Montevideo. He tries to use his hypno-vibration power to make them docile, but that wanes too having no effect. Luckily, Arsenal wakes up just in time to save Superman, and as the police arrive on the scene, Lois Lane does so too. She believes Superman to be innocent, and so the two of them get to a safe area by using Superman's limited levitating abilities. We also see Lex Luthor at Lex School watching everything happen simultaneously, then switching to a feed of his daughter who also has the virus. Back at Lois's home, Superman is in slight awe about sharing the same space as Prime Superman but Lois is worried for him, trapped as he is in the future. Future Superman, however, assures her that he'll be okay, and dresses in Clark's clothes as he intends to infiltrate Lexcom. When asked why, he explains what the virus is and that in order to defeat it, he'll need access to the most advanced technology available in this time to build a living sun. At Lexcom, the two of them are trying to find a solution when Lois mentions the Fortress of Solitude, which future Superman discerns could have the technology they need. At that moment, they're confronted by Luther, who's aware of future Superman's identity and offers to help him combat the virus. Superman asks him to arrange transport for components to be moved from the Fortress of Solitude. But when they reach the place, Superman is unable to get in, as the Fortress doesn't recognize him as Superman of Kryptonian. Luther tries to get into the place by force, but also fails. Superman uses his ESP to wipe all their memories, which brings things back to square one. This time, Superman asks to use Luther's lab and he agrees, but it ends up being a trap. Luther wants to take Superman apart atom by atom in order to find out a cure for the virus. He's attacked by Lex's soldiers in warsuits, but even in his weakened state, Superman is able to defeat them using his EMP powers and a good old-fashioned punch. They still need to get out, which is a problem because Superman can't get the doors open. There's a keypad, but that provides more than 15 million combinations. After a little thinking, Superman comes up with the right code and they're able to escape LexCore. Superman is tired after being denied two of the best sources of technology at that time. He says he'll need to call the Justice Legion A for help. He also says he'll need a human blood sample, which Lois offers up readily. Superman thinks about how much this little gesture is going to mean in the future, and as the issue comes to a close, he heads for the JLA Watchtower on the moon. The story is continued in JLA number 1 million. Superboy number 1 million. 1 million? And counting. This tie-in issue begins with future Superboy, the millionth clone of the original, homing in on the 20th century Fortress of Solitude's location in order to find a lost Justice League member. He finds a singular body buried under a big chunk of ice and breaks it open. The body is retrieved with the help of other members of Justice League S, made up entirely of various Superboy clones. Turns out, the frozen body is the original Guardian, cryogenically preserved in the ice all this time. The Superboys are able to revive him with Million X's help, and although in a frantic state, the Guardian recognizes Superboy. The clone tells him that he's safe and in the Project Cadmus facility, the most advanced genetic research center in the known cosmos. Million X explains to the Guardian that he has no memories, to which the hero from the past agrees. Superboy implores Million X to help restore the old hero's memories, as they might hold a clue to helping the Justice League of the past that stuck in the future. Million X accedes and projects the Guardian's memories outside of him for everyone to see. They watch the first Superboy in the 20th century Cadmus facility meet up with the Guardian and Dr. Serling Roquette, facilitating the delivery of a Dr. Seuss model kit from the 50s. Superboy then accidentally triggers a machine inside of the Doctor's lunchbox, which turns out to be a genetic scanner. At the same time, they find that Dabney Donovan has been brought back to Cadmus under military supervision. The Guardian warns them that Donovan is quite dangerous and shouldn't be allowed here. While they're having this discussion, the Hourman virus attacks and infects everyone. Everyone at the scene tries to figure out a plan of action, and since Superboy is a field agent, they settle on sending him to a metropolis with the genetic scanner to help him understand the virus better. Superboy heads to Metropolis, where he meets future Superman. Future Superman, in order to prove his credibility, uses his ESP powers to show Superboy glimpses of the future. However, back in the actual future, 
Million X's projections have caused a chronal vortex that tear the original Superboy through time. The clones use their link to the original to give him the strength necessary to escape the vortex and jump back into the present, after which the vortex collapses. Million X is reluctant to try again, but he doesn't have to as the Guardian's memories are starting to come back. He explains that Superboy went back to the Cadmus facility with future Superman, and the bossman Cannon decides to help him in building Solaris. He also decides to reveal Project Cadmus to the public, which the Guardian seems to be opposed to. Superboy wonders if this might be the virus taking over, but the Guardian assures him that it's simply caution as the issue comes to a close. Detective Comics No. 1 Million – The Bug That Ate Tomorrow Continuing the story from Nightwing number 1 million, this issue picks up with future Batman and Nightwing in the Batcave as they meet Alfred and the third Robin, Tim Drake. Future Batman says he'll need Tim's help with the Batcave's computer, specifically its AI system. He also explains that the Batcave supercomputers are rather underwhelming, as he has ten times that much memory in his internal systems. So, after giving the Batcave's computer a boost, Batman and Robin get to work on finding a cure for the Hourman virus, while Alfred and Nightwing watch in some awe and confusion. Batman learns that the Firefly is inciting infected citizens to set their homes on fire, and that since the law enforcement isn't up to the task, it's upon them to stop the chaos. While they're on the way, Batman explains what exactly the virus is, and that he can be in two places at once to give attention to the virus while still taking care of the Firefly. As the heroes of Gotham reach the site of Firefly's chaos, they're ambushed by fire and people with torches. Back at the Batcave, future Batman Shadow comes to the inevitable conclusion that this virus could only have been the creation of Solaris. Alfred is too old for this shit. Actual Batman also finds Firefly unamusing, as he's easily defeated. With the chain of command broken down, the people start to come to their senses, at least temporarily, but not before one of them blows up Nightwing's monster truck. As they assess the damage in the aftermath, Batman explains to everyone that he must reach out to the Justice League, and in order to destroy Solaris, they'll have to create Solaris. The issue ends here, and the story is continued in JLA number 1 million. JLA number 1 million, Prisoners of the 20th Century. This issue, which converges and continues the story of Batman, Superman, Flash, and more, starts with future Batman and future Superman meeting to take inventory of all the tech they've gathered, plus Lois Lane's blood sample. Even with his waning powers, Superman attempts to leap to the moon, where the JLA Watchtower is located. At the Watchtower, the remaining members of the JLA, Plastic Man, Zoriel, Big Barda, Huntress and Steel are assessing the situation while trying to find a way to bring the Charter members of the JLA back home. Steel has some time travel hardware that he adapted from Epoch, the Lord of Time, but they're not sure of how it works. First, they need to figure out how to defend the station, as future Superman lands on the moon and something takes control of the tower's teleportation channels. Meanwhile, on the Great Wall of China, the Justice Legion A is gathered and discussing strategy of their own. They're the ones who have planned on teleporting to the tower with Superman's help and anticipate a hostile encounter. Future Wonder Woman takes on Big Barda while Zoriel confronts future Batman, who's checking on present Batman's body since his soul is in the future in a future Batman clone body, but is soon accosted by future Aquaman. Huntress manages to confuse future Flash in the changing room and tranquilizes him as Plastic Man attacks and traps him. Zoriel manages to break out of Aquaman's water prison and is about to attack, but Batman unmasks himself and pleads him to listen. Similarly, Steel could have deployed weapons from the Watchtower's armory, but didn't because he believes the Justice Legion A deserves a chance. Future Superman is there and he shows Steel the components he's gathered and asks for his help. Big Barda seems to be winning against future Wonder Woman too, but is stopped by Steel. They start working together, coordinating with Martian Manhunter, Hourman, and Oracle to take stock of the situation. As the United Justice League members from past and present are building Solaris, a cruel play on the villain's part, they discuss ways to power it. Superman tells Steel that his time engine could be used for that purpose, since it wouldn't be very helpful for deep time travel anyway. Steel wonders where Solaris expected Superman to find this kind of energy if not for the time engine. Superman explains that Batman was wondering the very same, and the obvious choice would be Green Lantern's power ring or Starman's gravity rod. Just then, Starman appears, claiming to be late because of family business. Batman accuses him of betraying the Legion, and asks him to explain exactly what the Night Fragment is. The issue ends there, and the story continues in DC 1 million number 3. Aquaman number 1 million, the banks and shoals of time. Like every individual charter member of the Justice League who finds themselves in a celebratory challenge of their own, this tie-in issue of DC's 1 million saga starts with Aquaman in the 853rd century on the planet Neptune, which is his future counterpart's world of protection. The underwater hero is greeted by a sentient fish-like construct called Pilot who acts as his guide through this new and interesting time. 
They arrive at the Maxathea Sound, a natural seafloor basin 5,000 meters below the oceanic surface of Neptune. All the city ships appear to have arrived there to watch the celebratory challenge, as well as over a billion tourists, since Neptune is the popular resort in known space. After taking it all in, Pilot takes Aquaman to meet some important guests, including future Aquaman's chief aide, Tempest, who controls the weather on Neptune. The conversation is cut short, however, as Pilot says it's time for the challenge. The challenge is to demonstrate his telepathic and empathic link to the ocean, as future Aquaman doesn't seem to possess this ability. Although a little self-conscious, Aquaman manages to call to the ocean's life and it responds well. He comes across known species, as well as alien ones, and all of them seem to understand him. Slowly, he regains his confidence, he even gets to fly on some whale-like creatures. However, elsewhere, in a place called Cryon's Rift, a tesseract activates and releases a dreadful leviathan. Tempest feels its presence, and it strains her empathic link. Aquaman tries to subdue him telepathically to no avail. Pilot tells him that there's no reasoning with a kraken. He also tells them that it's from a world where the oceans are different, which means his biology is incompatible for Neptune. Aquaman deduces that the kraken must be in agony then, which is why it seems to be so rageful. Pilot then informs him that the news is blaming Aquaman for releasing the monster. Aquaman, with the help of some giant calamari, manages to restrain the Kraken, but Tempest, believing the news blaming Aquaman, attacks him and the Kraken is freed again. Tempest and Aquaman engage in a brief scuffle, but Pilot butts in and shows Tempest that it's not Aquaman's fault and that he's helping. During this time, the Kraken escapes and continues on his rampage across the city ships. Pilot tells Aquaman that he should ask the reefs for help, and they set off to find them. In the depths of the ocean, the reefs exist as the biggest creatures in the system, with a collective mind that encompasses more knowledge than can be imagined. The reefs reach out to Aquaman through a telepathic link and ask him why he's come. Aquaman explains the situation and asks for their help in calming the Kraken. The reefs agree to help and, with their immense power, they're able to stop the Kraken just in time. With the help of some starfaring traders, the Kraken is sent back on its way to its homeworld. Aquaman deduces that this was a scheme to discredit him. Pilot relays a message that the Justice League has been called to Legion headquarters on Jupiter. The issue comes to a close as Aquaman hitches a ride with the traders. Wonder Woman number 1 million, Legends this tie-in issue starts with Wonder Woman recounting her origin, being sculpted from clay by her mother, an Amazon. The Amazons are immortal, and in the 853rd century, they've colonized the planet Venus. Like every other JLA member, Wonder Woman has her own celebratory challenge here, and we're thrust into the middle of it as Diana goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with her sister Artemis, who's a formidable warrior. Wonder Woman soon finds herself in the clutches of a giant robot statue and flies away to escape, but instead takes it up with her. She then simply stops, and the giant statue robot falls into the ocean. As she suspected, two Amazons flee from within the robot, and after that she's able to escape. However, she loses consciousness and subsequently wakes up in the Temple of Healing, which has also evolved with the times. Artemis explains to Wonder Woman that they almost lost her, because the genetic code in their archives is different from her current one. It works out in the end. She also tells Wonder Woman that combat is their way, and that she shouldn't judge the Amazons after having fought countless battles with the JLA. The next day, news comes in of all the other JLA members and the ways in which all their celebratory exhibitions went wrong. As Diana watches this, many Amazon warriors arrive, badly wounded in battle. Artemis seems to have it the worst, and the Queen, Diana and Artemis' mother, puts all the warriors in the Temple of Healing. However, there seems to be some sabotage as the healing ray is not working. Everyone except the Queen is quick to blame Wonder Woman, and the mother-daughter duo end up fighting the Amazons. The Queen tells Diana to escape and find a way to fix this. Just as Diana is about to, she finds that she's lost her powers. She manages to flee the city anyway and ends up in the forest where she comes across Megala the Mystic. Megala suggests that she knows who's behind these acts of sabotage and takes Wonder Woman to her Tesseract. An outside force has been slowly reprogramming the Healing Ray, turning it into a lethal weapon triggered by Wonder Woman's DNA. Megala explains that the damage to the ray may be reversible, but she can't be sure unless Wonder Woman dies again. So, while Megala attacks the ray's emitters and purges the system, Wonder Woman goes into battle to be felled. The Queen and Megala take Wonder Woman's dead body to the Temple of Healing, and Megala explains that as the ray touches death, it might reverse the effect. As soon as the ray is turned on, the temple explodes, and for a moment, everyone wonders what happened. But before all hope is lost, Wonder Woman flies out of the rubble, along with all the other Amazons who were injured, but are now fully revitalized. The issue comes to a close as Wonder Woman flies off into space in search of her League teammates. Chase number 1 million, don't believe it. 
The future counterpart of a lesser-known Gotham character, Cameron Chase, is explored in this tie-in issue that came out with the only volume that focused on the character. The issue starts with a bit of backstory on the Department of Extranormal Operations, a secret organization that watches and controls the actions of certain superhumans. Sandoval Lucas Castro van Leiden, a man who crossed the DEO, is pursued by officers of the agency and captured. The first officer, a lead, tells him of his crimes and passes judgment. He tries to fight back with powers, but one of the officers, a chase, uses her technology to suppress the powers. Once suppressed, the third officer, a snare, is supposed to bring him in. However, Leiden tries to teleport away, but it goes wrong and he gets spliced into a nearby wall. The three officers who were part of the capture are called back to the DEO's headquarters, where the Skull, the head of the organization, asks the officers what went wrong. The three of them recount the encounter piece by piece. Snare mentions that before dying, Leiden made reference to someone named Cheeto. Skull informs them that there was no known accomplice of Leiden's by that name. Chase throws up a headnet request and, after a little research, comes across a Cheeto Delmar on Mars, who was previously arrested for crimes similar to Leiden's. The Skull orders the officers to go after this man and gives them extra abilities, as the task might be more dangerous than usual. The three officers teleport to his house with ease, where he appears to be chilling. He says he knew Sandoval. They used to do business from time to time. They also discuss his lack of data due to having no headnet and how ineffective it can be to have paper books around. He says it's a consequence of serving machines. They ask him about information on illegal power icon smuggling, and he explains that he's living a clean, quiet life. More than that, because of not having a headnet, his existence is almost erased. He has no life. Chase is a little taken aback upon learning this. Snare and Lee try to force themselves into his mind anyway, but before they can, Cheeto's daughter Aeolette interrupts them and says that she's the one they're looking for. She says that those icons were prototypes and that she didn't know Sandoval was going to resell them. Chases say they'll have to verify her intentions telepathically, but before they can, Cheeto intervenes. Snare pins him down, and Chase tries to de-escalate the situation, but Aeolette says the computers who control and manipulate the system won't stop until someone is punished for this. She attacks the officers and attempts to make a run for it. Snare tells Chase to neutralize her, but Chase refuses. Her actions are noted and she's called back to headquarters. Skull asks her to explain herself, and Chase expresses her doubts about the job. Skull then tells her that she was once a Chase too, questioned her position as well. Only after she became a Skull did she understand the full picture. She then asks Chases to go into a room and read a set of hard copy files that will be enlightening. The issue comes to a close as Skull promises to talk about Chase's future once she's read the files. Creeper number one million Insanitation. This tie-in issue starts by telling you to momentarily stop caring about the whole One Million saga, because you're reading Creeper now. The time, the 853rd century. The place, the 13th rogue planet of the Sol system that has an orbit so complex that it never traces the same path twice. A trickster planet and homeworld of the Creeper. The planet, called Lai, is a nexus of improbability where information always floats in the ether. One entity that's adept at traversing this ocean of information is Ryder, which is now drawn toward chaotic events. Consequently, in times of need, Ryder undergoes a state of inversion, becoming the distillation of raw madness known as the Creeper. Sniffing out the root of the improbable problem that is beyond Ryder, Creeper reaches the inevitable solution, time travel. He pushes back through time, all the way to the moment when the 20th century Creeper and Jack Ryder were split into two separate individuals. The 20th century Creeper is splitting into more and more parts, and Jack isn't too enthusiastic about another one showing up from God knows where. Meanwhile, there are other split creepers running around the city wreaking havoc. One creeper eats another, only to be eaten by some other creeper. Future creeper eventually returns to Jake and his first split creeper and asks them to choose who lives and who dies. Jake says the creeper will have to go through him, and so he does, to get the present creeper. One creeper gets sucked into the other, then vice versa, and both of them turn out to be fine. Ryder and his creeper merge again, feeling better than ever. Future creeper takes that as his cue and leaves. Ryder accepts his Creeper as a true partner, and they go off to fight crime. Back in the future, the Creeper pulls a cannibal Creeper out of himself and squashes him. He revels in a job well done, being the solution to the temporal meta-paradox that he caused. Once again, he morphs back into Ryder, who now has the task of creating a proper record of events. The issue ends by stating that this is but one of the 999,988 untold tales. Martian Manhunter number 1 million, The Abyss of Time 
A continuation of the story from Green Lantern number 1 million, this issue begins with Martian Manhunter remembering what year it is, 853rd century, and why he needs to remember. It's the Green Comet that makes him remember, the comet actually being a falling Kyle Rayner, aka the Green Lantern. Martian Manhunter, in the form of giant hands made of the Martian sands, manages to catch him. Manhunter nudges Kyle subconscious and the ring activates, revitalizing the Green Lantern. Kyle wakes up and wonders how Martian Manhunter, his friend Jean, is here because they left him back in the 20th century. Jean explains that he was in the 20th century, but he's lived since then and now he's here. Kyle's surprised Jean remembers him after so many eons, but Jean explains that he remembers because Kyle saved him in the future during his darkest moments. He also recalls his future after the 20th century. Events like fighting the space arc robot called Antari 7 and the planetary system, then fighting the swarm for 20,000 years until the fight eventually came to Earth. After winning the war, Jean came back to Mars and wandered the sands until he lost track of time. He found a way to heal, and others came to him, with whom he shared his knowledge and wisdom. He talked of heroes and values, and he loved it. But then Darkseid came. He turned Mars into a copy of Apocalypse, his home planet, and created a bleak society. The Justice League eventually fought him in an all-out war, a war they weren't planning on winning. The goal was to lure Darkseid into a realm of light. Once Jean and Darkseid fell into it, they were greeted by an embodiment of the light. It quelled Darkseid's hate and took it away into the brightness. The light then asks what Jean wants, and he tells it that he wants Mars to go back to the way it was. He wants peace. So the light merges his very being with the planet, which means that Jean can now shape the world to his will. Since then, he has been Mars, and all those who live on Mars are now a part of him, and he is a part of them. Kyle takes this all in, and then asks Jean for his help with defeating Solaris. Jean tells him that a plan to defeat him was set in motion eons ago, and that the night fragment buried in Martian sands will reveal itself at the right time and help defeat Solaris. He also asks Kyle to deliver a message to his younger self when the time is right, which he will know when it comes. Finally, Jean tells Kyle to go to Jupiter and embrace his destiny. As the issue comes to a close, he reveals that the message is simply that the future is worth it. As for his final piece, he contacts Resurrection Man. The story continues in Resurrection Man number 1 million. Adventures of Superman number 1 million, Keepers of Solitude. Running somewhat parallel to Martian Manhunter number 1 million and continuing the story from Action Comics number 1 million, this issue starts with Superman Prime from the past reaching future Superman's Fortress of Solitude. As he's going down memory lane, looking at the collection of remnants from his past, he's interrupted by Resurrection Man. He too believes Superman Prime to be a bizarro evil version, and thus activates the Fortress's security measures. Superman's able to dodge them, but going mano mano with Resurrection Man proves to be more difficult. Eventually, Resurrection Man is able to pacify Superman using his arsenal of powers, even if he has to die and be resurrected every time he accesses them. Once the scuffle is over, Resurrection Man explains to Superman the way his powers work, how he controls them, that he's been alive for thousands of years. He also explains that the Superman dynasty made him custodian of the Fortress of Solitude a long time ago. He uses the strategy engine in the fortress to help the Justice Legion A as their chief strategist. When Superman tells him that he's never heard of him, Resurrection Man reveals his identity. Mitch Shelley tells Superman that they fought together for a long time against recurring enemies like Vandal Savage. As the Justice League evolved, he assisted them too, eventually ending up as a tactical advisor to the Legion. Superman mentions that Martian Manhunter was their tactical advisor, and Resurrection Man tells him that no one had heard from Jean in centuries until today. He came with a warning that Solaris was behind the whole conspiracy to take down the Justice League. To thwart its plan, Resurrection Man says that they're going to need help. Meanwhile, on Mars, Solaris talks to Savage about how their plan is coming along. Savage asks whether the League is causing trouble. Solaris says that while they've been bothersome, plans are in place to handle them, including Superman will die at the fortress. The help Resurrection Man was referring to is the Justice Legion B, comprising of Arsenal, Troy, Nightwing, and Aqualad. They're waiting on a fifth and final member, Johto. A teleportation malfunction kills him. Soon after, Arsenal starts to corrupt and morph into a smaller version of Solaris. It infects the fortress with its puppet virus, and soon the remaining members of Legion B, Superman and Resurrection Man, have to go up against its auto defenses. In the ensuing battle, Resurrection Man dies again, a minor inconvenience for him. As the rest of them try to keep the defenses busy, Superman flies to the CPU of the fortress in order to find a way to stop the defenses by reconfiguring the default language of the fortress to Kryptonian. 
In the aftermath, Arsenal's system is purged of the virus. He starts to slowly put himself back together. Resurrection Man gives Superman his future counterpart spare costume, which has a built-in boom tube that will allow him to get to Jupiter to help the League. As for himself, Resurrection Man heads to Mars to deal with Savage. The story continues in Resurrection Man number 1 million and Man of Tomorrow number 1 million. Resurrection Man number 1 million, a handful of dust. The story picks up with the titular character of this issue after Adventures of Superman number 1 million, with a brief recap of the events of the 1 million saga so far from Resurrection Man, aka Mitchell Shelley, to all active Justice Legion members and system protection authorities in receiving range. He also mentions that Solaris is now headed for Jupiter, where the Justice League are gathered and coming up with a plan to defeat the Living Sun. As for himself, he's headed to Mars to face off with Vandal Savage and accepts one last call from the Teen Titans for help. He notices that the force field around Savage's compound keeps the Martian dust out but lets him in, which he deduces to mean that Savage wants him there. He's attacked by Savage's excavating machines, which are no match for his ionic rays. He makes his way to Savage, who says that this will be the last time they have to do this particular dance of facing off the way they've done over thousands of years. Solaris hurries Savage about the Night Fragment, but Savage tells him that he lacks the importance of human social graces. Mitchell is his oldest friend after all, and they've been alive a lot longer than Solaris has. Mitchell asks what the Night Fragment is, and Savage shows him a piece of green rock that's deadly. Mitchell assumes that it's kryptonite, which Savage tells him is the last piece in the universe, a piece that will end the Superman dynasty forever. Resurrection Man tells Savage that he'll thwart this scheme, but Savage retorts that him being allowed to come here was part of his scheme. He puts on an Omnicron knife suit and they have a fight. Meanwhile, the Teen Titans arrive on Mars and find themselves shut out from Savage's compound by the shield wall. Arsenal says he can't cut through it, but then Aqualad suggests that his fluid wear might be able to get in and cleave an opening in between the particles. They manage to make it through the wall and are immediately ambushed by some of Savage's excavating machines. The fight is going well for the Titans, but they're then surprised by something new. Back at the Savage vs Resurrection Man fight, it looks like Resurrection Man has the upper hand, but then Savage pulls one last move and stabs the hero in the chest. Resurrection Man remembers all the times they fought across time, and Savage tells him that this is going to be the last time, as the knife suit cuts in a way that even Shelley can't come back from. However, as a last desperate measure, Shelley uses Bioflux to sacrifice some of his Tektites, which kill him instantly so that he can revive with a new power to attack Savage's knife suit at an atomic level and disable it. But in another twist, that's just what Savage hoped Shelley would do, as he needed a sample of the Tektites so that he could configure his nano disassemblers to take his structure apart a molecule at a time. As Resurrection Man is being taken apart bit by bit, Savage tells him that the Teen Titans won't come to his rescue because they've run into one of his deja vu mines planted in their path, which means they've been repeating the same encounter over and over again all this time. As Savage is about to deliver a coup de grace with Hannibal's sword, Resurrection Man teleports into strata space, taking Savage's arm along with him and leaves the disassemblers there. Again, just as the fight is coming to an end, Savage pulls out another trick, a biomech virus disguised as a grain of sand that's been burrowing into Shelley's Resurrector. While he's occupied in the fight and overwhelming his system to keep killing the hero over and over again. With that, Savage takes the Night Fragment and leaves Resurrection Man to die in agony as he opens the shield wall and lets the storm in. As Shelley is dying over and over again, he hears the familiar voice of an old friend. The issue comes to a close as Shelley seems to get buried in the dust and the story continues in DC 1 million number 4. Catwoman number 1 million, 9 million lives. Picking up from a cliffhanger at the end of Batman 1 million, as Catwoman arrives at the scene of the Batcave, ready to help Prime Batman and Robin, the toy wonder, at a price. In exchange for getting them into the Batcave so that Batman can get the boom suit and teleport to Jupiter, Catwoman wants to get off this planet. Robin says he can't authorize that, but Batman says he can and it's a deal. His billions of lives are at stake. Robin agrees and tells her that she not only needs to break into the Batcave, but get past its interior defenses and shut down the defense computer in the data room at the cave's core. Catwoman isn't thrilled to hear this, but goes in anyway. Everything seems quiet as Catwoman starts making her way in and it feels like it's gonna be an easy job, but just then she's attacked by one of the Batcave's defenses. She defeats it and gets past the first screen, but then sees that a few inmates have also made their way in. They think she's another defense mech and start going after her. As if stuck between a rock and a hard place, Catwoman soon finds herself facing an anti-riot tank. The tank, thankfully, takes out the inmates chasing her, and she's able to cut a hole through the ground just in time not to get trampled. The place she ends up in is some sort of lair where she meets a young girl. The girl claims to be a fellow inmate trying to escape. 
However, Catwoman isn't interested and calls her corrupted. The girl says it's a misunderstanding and is about to attack Catwoman, but the two of them are ambushed by two giant bat robots, more of the Batcave's defenses. She manages to take one out, but in the process of destroying the other, also damages her battle suit. Looking for a more efficient way to get in, she hijacks a bat probe and rides it all the way to the main entrance of the Batcave. Here, she tries to hack into its systems, but can't get the doors open or the defenses shut down. She tries to get the vents open by making the cave seem like it's registering dangerous levels of plasma, but is also attacked by the system's defenses in the process because she stayed connected too long. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin outside are fighting the laughter and wonder if she's made it in. The Batcave Catwoman finds is full of countermeasures, which could take out a small army, so she uses robotic mice to trigger the traps and then makes her way in safely. Once she finds the Bat computer, She's able to deactivate the locks and the emergency systems to let Batman and Robin in. Batman wonders why Catwoman just didn't take a shuttle and escape. Catwoman replies by giving the hero a passionate kiss and reminding him that she's only human, after all. She tells Batman where the boom suit is and heads for the shuttle. However, just as she thinks she's free to go home, she finds Killer Croc is on the ship. Luckily, he doesn't prove to be too much trouble. Catwoman is able to make it out of Pluto safely, with now the universe hers to roam free. Robin number 1 million, Dark Planet. This issue of the 1 million saga picks up Batman and Robin's story after the events of Catwoman number 1 million. As the Toy Wonder faces off with the prison planet's inmates as Batman tries to figure out a way to get the boom suit so that he can teleport to Jupiter and meet up with the Justice League and help with the fight against Solaris. However, Batman is less than familiar with the futuristic supercomputer. Luckily, he's able to call up a sentient hologram of future Batman who offers to help. Meanwhile, Toy Wonder seems to be doing well in his fight against the inmates, but then has to face off against the Joker's legacy incarnation in the future, the laughter. Robin takes on the laughter with relative ease, but in a turn of events, the villain uses a power spike knife to oversurge Robin's electronic body. After that, the laughter drags him along to go see Batman. Inside the Batcave, Batman and Hologram Batman are discussing his legacy, as well as the bleakness of future Batman's mission. Nonetheless, it has to be done, and Hologram Batman says he'll program the boom suit to take him to Jupiter. Hologram Batman is about to say something further, but disappears as the laughter comes in. He demands the boom suit in exchange for Robin, and while Robin explains that he's only a program, Batman gives in anyway. Now wearing the boom suit, the laughter teleports, but somehow ends up in open space. Batman, in an effort to still escape the planet and save Robin, fly off in the Omnibat to find a prisoner named Flanagan, a gene manipulator. They catch him and his rat army just in time and coerce him into taking them with him. Once they're in space, Batman tells Flanagan to head for Jupiter. On the way, Robin slowly succumbs to his injuries and says it's time for a new model. The issue comes to a close as the ship heads for the Legion moon. Flanagan mentions that if he doesn't have the access codes, the ship will be blown to bits. Batman says they'll worry about that problem when they get to it. The story continues in DC 1 million number 4. Flash number 1 million, fast forward. Picking up Flash's story in the 853rd century, this issue actually starts with a prologue showing us Commander Cold and Heatwave, two of Mercury's information criminals, in action as they both get a message from a mysterious entity to work together in capturing Flash. Both of them agree, as even if Flash turns out to be a fake like Headnet says, he could still be worth quite a lot. After the prologue, we meet Flash doing a short recap of the 1 million saga events for the reader before explaining that he's on Mercury, which is now the richest biocyte in the solar system. Information flows fastest here. Also, since the planet doesn't rotate, the two hemispheres stay hot and cold, the same temperature all the time. Flash's celebratory challenge on Mercury is a race, and turns out who better to race the speedster than himself. Through some time-breaking mechanics, Flash is able to go so fast that he slips in the past a little bit, after which he has to catch up with himself. In any case, he wins the race against himself and is about to celebrate when he feels a sudden surge of cold. Turns out, it's Commander Cold's doing. He and Heatwave have hijacked Mercury's network feed. They explain that by stealing some of Flash's power, they plan on jumpstarting the planet's rotation, which will destroy its delicately calibrated data link with the soon and throw off the world's terracology too. They further explain that this Flash must be a dupe to be so easily taken over and used as a power source for such a villainous scheme. In any case, they say it'll be fun to watch him slowly die. Flash thinks it's hopeless too, unless some other energy is introduced into the system. Lucky for him, he lent the air molecule some momentum as he was hustling around Mercury and that they should be hitting his spot any second now. A wind stronger than the planet has ever seen. Using that very wind, Flash manages to escape the energy sucking while the two villains are thrown off their game for a moment. In the ensuing battle, 
Flash finds Commander Cold and Heatwave to be formidable opponents, as their futuristic technology allows them to counter his usual moves. Even so, he's got bigger problems as Mercury is about to start spinning at any moment, and he needs to exert enough spin control to stop that from happening. Then it hits. A possible solution. He runs away to find help. Beneath the wealthy cities of Mercury, Flash goes to the area where the information poor folk live, with the aim of finding the place that the news said the Flash imposters came from. He finds the portal to the Rock of Eternity, finds a skirmish already in progress. Since the place is a motherload of valuable information, every superpowered being is there for their peace. Lucky for him, he's got some time to think due to infighting among the villains, and as he's trying to figure out a way, Billy and Tannist, bearers of the power of Shazam, show up to help. Now, the heroes outnumber the villains, and it becomes much easier to strategize and defeat them. There's still the problem of the planet spinning, which starts to trigger apocalyptic-seeming events. However, the three heroes use the knowledge buried at the Rock of Eternity to find a way to restabilize the planet. Flash is tempted to look at accounts of his own future, but resists the temptation. Flash also deduces that Commander Cold and Heatwave wouldn't have been able to hatch this plan on their own, and someone bigger must have been behind it. This, he concludes, was just the tip of the iceberg, and he needs to get in touch with the Justice League to find out more. The issue concludes here, and the story continues in DC 1 million, number 3 and 4. Supergirl number 1 million, when she was good. This issue starts with a prologue centered on a character named Gura, who's dreaming of the time he fled the Andromeda galaxy. He's awoken from his stasis inside a nutrient bath for a task from the Chancellor. He also seems to have scratched an S on his chest in his sleep. He says that he's fine and goes to meet the Chancellor. The Chancellor tells him that the Zionteri are planning an attack to end the war against them. During their conversation, Dura notices a small blip on the map. The Chancellor asks whether it's a single fighter coming. As it gets closer, there's a look of horror on Dura's face. He says that the Destroyer is coming. It haunts his dreams, fills his nightmares, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. The Chancellor is taken aback and says that how can Dura, the bravest warrior among them, can be afraid of what turns out to be Supergirl. We see a small glimpse of Supergirl as she destroys a small comet while trying to play with it. Dura explains to the Chancellor that his planet was happy and peaceful, a paradise before she showed up and destroyed it. He was the sole survivor of their world. He tells the Chancellor to leave, abandon their planet, and run away. The Chancellor points out that Supergirl seems to be heading to the Zionteri Battle Fleet, which will give them a chance to see what she's made of. Dura simply says that even if the Zionteri are the enemy, they deserve a better fate. The Zionteri Battle Fleet sees Supergirl coming as well, and underestimates her. Supergirl gives the ships a little boot before going inside the flagship. The Zionteri's efforts to disintegrate her are futile, and the little hero starts wreaking havoc inside the ship, tearing out wires, damaging the power core, and eventually blowing up the ship and taking the others along with it. The Chancellor, watching this, asks Dura why he's walking away at their moment of triumph. Dura says he's going to go pack. Supergirl is now alone and sad about being alone again. However, she sees that there's still one ship left. She says she'll be really careful with it and try not to break it. As the ship heads for the Chancellor's planet, Dura says that anything the Chancellor says to him now is inconsequential, as his planet is not going to last much longer. The Chancellor warns him that this act of cowardice will mean all records of Dura will be stricken from the Bluffs civilization. Dura says that's fine and that they've been good to him. Nothing can save them now. And so, Dura leaves passing the Zionteri vessel on his way out. Back on the Zionteri ship, Supergirl accidentally takes out their regulator, which leads to the vessel phasing out and heading straight towards the Bulfsk planet on a ramming course. Supergirl tries to fix it, but fails, and the ship phases out again and goes to the planet's core, where it blows up, taking the planet along with it. Dura knew this would happen, and he wonders whether he's made it out in time. Turns out not, as the debris from the explosion is heading straight for his ship. Dura accepts his death, thinking that it will be a relief. To his dismay, Supergirl saves the ship. Telepathically, Supergirl calls him Daddy and asks why he keeps running away from her. Dura, calling her Uriel, tells her he's not her father. He pleads to her to let him go, and Supergirl starts crying. Finally, Dura relents and lets her tag along, but only after getting her to promise that she'll behave herself and stop calling him Daddy. She asks where they're going, and he tells her the Gundar system, and tells her to try and not blow it up. Man of Tomorrow, number 1 million, future story. Continuing from Adventures of Superman, number 1 million, this issue starts with Superman on his sixth failed attempt to teleport away from the Fortress of Solitude to the JLA headquarters at Jupiter. He realizes that something is blocking his efforts, even with the boom suit. He learns that at least the bizarro panic has died down, and that the general mood of the people towards the Justice League has improved after Solaris's treacherous acts were revealed. Superman decides to get in touch with the commander of the Hawkmen, Mahal Toj, and asks to meet in Metropolis. At their meeting, Superman tells him about being unable to teleport, 
and that Solaris seems to have a particular vengeance against him. He explains that he needs to be brought up to date. Mahal says he knows just the person to help, and takes the Man of Steel to the mayor of Metropolis, Gerarda Olsen. She apologizes to Superman for her earlier behavior, and offers her full cooperation. Together, they go to Luther, who installs the headnet into Superman so that he has full access to it. The information overload seems to be too much for the 20th century Superman brain. However, this gives him an idea. They all head to the junkyard and meet with Platinum, one of the metal men. She's delighted to see him, and he says he needs her help, specifically with her robotic abilities that recorded everything that happened between the Superman dynasty and Solaris over the last 833 centuries. Platinum recounts the stories, starting with Superman fighting Solaris in the 21st century. Toward the end of that century, he leaves Earth, but leaves it in the capable hands of Superman Secundus. Solaris fights him in the New Justice League as well, losing the battle and ending up in the Boiling Sea. Then, the early years of the 29th century saw the Computer Sun return with an army of sentient comets. It took the combined might of the Justice League and the Legion of Superheroes to defeat him this time. By that time, the Superman dynasty was well established, and each generation had its own version of the Man of Steel. When the 67th century Superman wed Gesundt Pulz, Queen of the Fifth Dimension, he gained ten alien sensory powers and passed down the dynasty. During this time, his allies and enemies evolved as well. For instance, it was a Superman leading his office of Super Hunters who ended the centuries of bizarro scourge that nearly wiped out the human race in the 250th millennium. And yet, the war with Solaris raged on. In one battle in the 364th century, Solaris's plan backfired and gave the heroes quantum powers. But finally, in the 505th century battle, Solaris was reprogrammed by Superman with the help of the Fourth Singularity and the Gravity Witch, but he cost the Man of Steel his life. Since then, Solaris operated as a force for good, becoming a willing tool for those who sought to protect the solar system. He remained a force for good, even fighting alongside Superman and the Justice League of the Atom. Slowly, Solaris became more influential as time passed, and in an era of universal paranoia, he formed the pan-cosmic justice Jihad, whose purpose was preemptive strikes against potential threats. Then, at the turn of the 700th century, Superman came back to Earth and his reign signaled the beginning of the system-wide great spiritual revival, even though Superman himself didn't want to be worshipped as a hero. He forged a covenant with that era Superman, stating that he would give the Superman powers far beyond any held by any metahuman as long as they stayed the protectors of Earth. These were powers gleaned from the very edge of time and space, administered by Superman Prime from his new fortress of solitude, deep within the hydrogen furnace of the system's yellow sun. And that's where he remained until now his prodigal return. In the meantime, Solaris's influence diminished as the return of Superman Prime brought out the best in humanity again. The pan-cosmic Justice Jihad was disbanded, and Solaris's subsequent efforts weren't very popular either. Ironically, it was the return of an alien that returned to humanity their best, while Solaris, born of man. The story is cut off as Solaris telepathically communicates his anger at what he considers lies. He says that he devoted so much of his time to selfless protection of the system, only to be sidelined by the Superman dynasty. Superman uses this jealousy to goad Solaris into letting him off the planet and uses a teleporter from the junkyard to go to Jupiter. Platinum also becomes a celebrity as everyone hears her retelling of Superman's tale in broadcast form. She closes the issue by telling everyone that the story of the Superman dynasty is more than just a history lesson. It's also a love story of Kal-El and Lois Lane, which will find its conclusion in DC 1 million, number 4. Kronos number 1 million, time on my hands. This issue starts on Metropolis of the 853rd century, a city built inside folded space, a tesseract. On Earth, its usual protector is away on businesses in another dimension, and so the city is in the hands of that era's Flash, John Fox. Flash is doing a great job and loving the easy day he's having when the city's logistical overseer integrated system, Lois, calls and informs him that all the Tesseract gates around the city are malfunctioning and he should investigate them. Flash makes it out of the nearest gate just in time before it closes. Now back on Earth, he goes to the gateway station to see what's wrong. There, he finds that every person at the station is in a state of deep sleep. He decides that reopening the gates first is more important. As he's trying to do that, he feels the presence of an intruder. He tries to ambush the intruder, but is hit instead with a burst of chronal energy that holds him in place. The intruder turns out to be Kronos, a fellow speedster who isn't always on the side of good. He steals Flash's time gauntlets and disappears. 
When Flash emerges from his suspended state, he realizes that the intruder is gone and all the gates have now been reopened. He tells Lois that this was a ruse to lure him and steal his gauntlets. He looks at the surveillance feed at a slow rate and is able to catch a glimpse of the thief and swears to catch him. The story then moves to Hong Kong in the year 11,021 AD, where a temporal parasite called the Chronovore is creating temporal distortions. Kronos is there, talking to random historical figures and waiting for a Superman to show up and save the day. Instead, John Fox shows up and puts an inhibitor on him, suppressing his ability to travel through time. Kronos, aka Gabriel, wonders how Flash got there. Flash explains that even though it was smart to hide inside a chronically unstable time, there were more than a few friends of his that were able to help him. Gabriel recognizes these as people from the linear time authority, who he doesn't see eye to eye with. Flash again asks for his gauntlets. Gabriel pulls them out of a tesseract, and just as Flash is about to take them again, Scourge shows up, claiming the gauntlets for himself. Gabriel says Flash just claimed them back, and so Scourge attacks Flash. Using a Savitar leech, Scourge disables Flash's speed force powers. Gabriel says they should just hand the gloves over. Scourge gets his hands on the glove as Gabriel transports them through time to escape. They end up in London in 1969, at the rooftop where the Beatles had their final public performance, and Flash asks Kronos if he has any clue the kind of chaos Scourge would cause with those gauntlets. Kronos says he knows exactly. Flash realizes where they are, and that the inhibitor never worked. He says everything will be fine and takes Flash back to Scourge. The demon warlord says that he's going to conquer all of time. He pops out, then pops back in and repeats the same thing. Turns out Kronos trapped him in a time loop. He explains that if not for the gloves, Scourge would have used a time engine to travel across centuries and destroy Krypton and Superman's ancestors. Flash asks why Kronos simply didn't ask for him, to which the time traveler replies that it's not his style, and then dips out. Flash is unhappy about being left behind, but our man comes in to bring him back, since Kronos left the time-traveling robot a message. The story then moves to Chronopolis, a city immune from time and Kronos' headquarters, where Gabriel celebrates a job well done with his cat. However, our man arrives there and asks him why he gave Scourge duplicate gauntlets while keeping the original ones with himself. Gabriel explains that it was necessary for the survival of the Justice Legion A in the past and the Justice League in the future. Our man tells him he'll never understand Kronos' methods, but he knows that the gloves will be returned to John Fox when the danger has passed and he'll meet Kronos again as an adversary. As the issue comes to a close, Kronos tells him that they're both trapped in an elaborate game for all time, but he's trying to change the rules. Young Heroes in Love number 1 million. Happiness is a warm nanite. Young Heroes in Love is a tie-in that takes place on the JLA Watchtower Museum hologram in the year 85,271. It starts with a group of girls and boys who are debating what to play. The boys want to play Atom Ball, while the girls want to play Superhero. One of the kids, Nancy, is off Kidnet, a child-friendly version of Headnet from the 1 million saga, and Teddy, the main boy, teases her about not being able to watch it, especially since it's past their bedtimes. Alexina, one of the girls, says she'll stay up no matter what. Teddy says it doesn't matter, and he asks Nancy to come play ball instead. Nancy punches him and leaves. Conrad, aka Squirt, one of the boys, says that girls make no sense. Teddy asks if he's so smart, why does he still carry a blanket around? Squirt explains that it reminds him of happy times. Teddy reminds him, that he's four. Alexina's mom introduces the girls to a new boy named Chip. She also talks about being sorry that all the parents have to work during their vacation, but there are important dignitaries coming to the museum soon. This gets Nancy even more excited to watch the JLA's broadcast. The girls introduce Chip to the boys, and Teddy immediately asks him to play Atom Ball. He agrees. Chip also reveals that he has a superpower, and to demonstrate, he punches Teddy hard enough to knock him out. Afterward, they play Atom Ball on the highest setting, and Teddy ends up breaking a Superman memorial in the process. Mr. Rehnquist, a mean old man, catches them and takes away their ball, and Ice Caster offers to fix the memorial. Now, Nancy again proposes to play superheroes, since they have enough boys for the Justice League. The Ice Caster also offers to help. The six of them dress up as Thunderhead, Monster Girl, Zip Kid, Junior, and Bonfire. Together, they get into a bunch of hijinks at the superhero celebration and end up missing the show. However, they do get a seat under the Justice League's table, which makes for an interesting experience for them. Meanwhile, the Ice Caster is revealed to be original Young Heroes member Frostbite, and he comes across another member, Off Ramp. The two of them catch up on 85,000 years, what they've been up to, and so on. After the celebration, the boys don't really feel like playing Atom Ball anymore. On his way back, Conrad comes across Superman, who asks him where he got the blanket. Conrad says he found it with some stuff for the museum. Superman says the museum would like it back, and Conrad returns it. Turns out, it was Superman's cape. The issue comes to a close with a snapshot of the young heroes in love.
Lobo, number one million. Lobo's last job. In the 853rd century, Lobo is an exhibition at a circus in the United Galaxy cluster. The audience ridicules him. One person asks if a cage is enough to hold him. The circus owner tells them that the cage is made of nuclear tire iron and will hold anything. The audience then starts to ridicule him more. Lobo gets angry and breaks the cage, proclaiming that he's gonna kill everyone. The circus owner says that the only thing that will placate him is money, so everyone throws their money and runs away. Turns out, it's a routine plan to scam alien tourists out of money. Lobo says it's demeaning work and wonders what happened to the good old days of bounty hunting. Right then, a woman comes in and offers Lobo a billion dollars for a bounty. She wants him to chase and capture the legendary Malo Perverso. Lobo says that he's a myth, to which the woman replies that he exists and that he's her ex-lover. He accepts the job and leaves the circus for good. On the way, he scares a few more tourists with a dud grenade. He goes to Al's Dunt, which has now been converted into a diner that only sells the idea of fast food. They still have a teleporter, which Lobo uses, despite Al's warning that it's for inanimate objects only. After he leaves, Al's partner Darlene explains to him that she was the one who took on a disguise and hired him. She couldn't bear to see him be a conman and rot away. She also explains that she sent him on a wild goose chase, and that Marlo Perverso doesn't actually exist. Al prays that Lobo won't destroy his diner again. Lobo travels to a tesseract where his bike and equipment are. He'd put a tracker on them years ago. But he can't seem to shoot his way out of the folded space, so he tears it open. He ends up at the Justice Legion wannabes' headquarters and starts battling with them. The wannabes were in the middle of facilitating a mind meld between the Orion Cluster and people from the Magellanic Clouds, which now go dark really quick. Back at the headquarters, Lobo is trying to find Marlo Perverso, but the villain finds him first and they have a good old-fashioned brawl. Lobo sustains massive injuries, including a screw in his head, but since he's immortal, it doesn't much matter using a boot rocket. He takes Marlo Perverso down, and it actually turns out to be Clayman. He forces Marlo's location out of Clayman, the Doomstein black hole. Lobo follows the trail, but not before sending a bomb back through the teleporter and blowing up Al's diner. Again, the issue ends with Lobo getting his groove back and not caring whether he actually finds Marlo, because huh, he's having fun again. Hitman number one million, to hell with the future. This issue is a kind of parody of the one million saga. It starts with Gwant, whose father owns the Chronix Corporation, and his friends break into the Chronix building to get time displacement gear and become heroes. They use the gear to bring back from the past Tommy Monaghan, the Hitman. They all seem to think Hitman is the greatest hero of 20th century Gotham. There's a brief interlude about teleporting vomit and kicking an unkillable cat out of the 20,000th floor window. But Gwant explains to Hitman soon that he and his friends want to siphon Hitman's powers and become superheroes themselves. However, Hitman is soon faced with a hero named Gunfire, who has targets on his knees for mm, some reason. While he's monologuing, Hitman shoots him in the knee. Gunfire then proceeds to accidentally shoot himself and then blow himself up. Just as this problem is out of the way, a whole group of powered people known as Overforce comes in to avenge Gunfire. Overforce, however, is intercepted first by Overpatrol, and soon they start fighting. Turns out, Overpatrol is really the League of Schweinhunds. There's a few more nonsensical twists, and then everyone throws off a catchphrase and starts fighting. However, Hitman takes them all out soon because he gets bored and then asks Grant to send him home. Grant asks how they can when he's demonstrated such legendary abilities and taken down so many powered people. Hitman shoots around them in frustration and explains that he has no powers and that if they don't send him home, he'll shoot them dead. As for the legend, Hitman explains that it was probably written thousands of years after his death and contains no truth. So, Gwant and his friends send Hitman home and decide to try again, to get a real hero this time. They end up bringing Etrigan the Demon to the future and he rips them all to shreds. That was that. Legion of Superheroes number 1 million, 1,000 years later. This issue starts in the 863rd century, when some adult-looking children find a picture of the Legionnaires and decided to keep it amongst themselves, not telling the adults. Afterward, Dav, one of the adult-looking children, is at home having dinner when his father asks him where he is. Dav lies about his whereabouts, but then his father finds out anyway and hits him, claiming that he's been touched by evil. Later, when the boys gather again to look at the picture, Dav tries to atomize it, repeating the thing about it being evil. The picture explodes, in actuality being a rune that had trapped the wild flame. The entity consumes the boys and starts telling the story of the last legion of superheroes. 
specifically the last generation of them. This story continues from where Legionnaires number 1 million left off, when Brainiac 417 goes back in time to get Superboy, aka Chris Kend, to help hold the United Planets worlds together. The Dreamer starts forecasting an image of nothingness, meaning that the Legion might be doomed to fail. While Cosmic Bot and Titan Girl are at the command center, Implicate Girl goes off to find Chameleon. The Umbra is on Chameleon's homeworld, where he believes the traitors are. Chameleon comes in to rescue the Umbra, again breaking his people's moral law against shape-shifting for anything other than camouflage. Brainiac 417 is holding back more metal-eating monsters, but is somehow hurt with a telepathic attack. In his dying moments, he learns that Titan Girl is the traitor, and Umbra and Chameleon learn that Titan World is nothing but a telepathic construct that hides a planet engine that wants to drift away from the United Planets. Titan Girl tries to attack Chameleon and the Umbra next, but Implicate Girl comes in time to turn the tide of battle. She figures out that Titan Girl is actually another construct of the planet Titan. The Legionnaires are able to defeat Titan Girl, at which point all illusions fade, including one that was making everyone think the planets were drifting apart. Turns out, the Titanians had given up their real world for virtual comfort, and are only now reawakening. Cosmic Bot says maybe they'll rejoin the United Planet someday. That's where the Wild Flame story ends and the boys wake up, babbling about living inside a tesseract and whether the United Planets made it back or not, and whether the Wild Flame was put there as an invitation. Dav's father finds them, thinks they're delirious, and takes them to a medical facility. There, he wakes up and still goes on about their life not being real, going to school, getting a job, having kids, etc, etc. But reality instead being about spaceships, ray guns and superheroes. Well, they're all put in a mental asylum, where the Wild Flame comes to Dav again and thanks him for keeping it alive by imagining and believing, so that it can stay free and remain alive in the memory of Titan Girl's perfection. Dav asks whether the Wild Flame is here to free him, to which the Flame responds that that is unnecessary, as the future is set. All he has to do is close his eyes and imagine it.